50 years ago, Jamaica attained independence and joined the United Nations. In these 50 years as a member state, it has shown strong leadership on significant issues. It has led UN actions on human rights and apartheid, and has served as an elected member of the Security Council. Jamaican nationals from diverse backgrounds have contributed substantially to development issues across the globe through their work at the UN. I was born and raised in Kingston, in Vineyard Town, and attended school at Rollington Town Government School. Got a scholarship to go to Kingston College, and after sixth form, uh, got employed at the uh, Treasury. I was educated at Troja Primary School in the parish of St. Catherine. In the year before I entered high school, I came to Kingston and attended Swallowfield Primary School because my mother was a teacher there. She was a primary school teacher. Um, I, I grew up in Clarendon and my father was a very technical person. He used to fix um, all electronic equipment and I sort of um, loved it. So I ended up going to Vera Technical High School and then um, my dream, of course, was to do something with electronics. Well, I was actually born in St. Catherine in Linstead, but I went to school at St. Hughes High School in Kingston. And then I spent a year as an exchange student in Brazil, living in Rio and then came back and did my degree, my first degree at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. Yeah, I was born in Maypen, Clarendon. My, my father was a public health inspector, and so he moved around the island, as so did we. I'm a Kingstonian, a Jamaican. Um, I began my studies at Camperdown High School in Kingston, and then subsequently I did my university education, mainly at the University of the West Indies, the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Striving to excel at every stage of their lives, they have transformed opportunity into achievement and contribution. Winning the Jamaica St. Henry Scholarship opened up new vistas for me. I was able to travel. I chose London University and I went there and did studied Spanish language and literature. And then for my master's program, they extended my scholarship and I was able to study international relations and history of Latin America. I had always been interested in political and social, social issues. I spent a year in California doing my master's as a, in forest management and returned to Jamaica just in time for independence in 1962. This is the land of my birth. I shall be in the early days of forestry uh, during independence, we realized that our capabilities um, were limited and we required uh, support and assistance to, um, to develop a better knowledge of our resources. And this gave rise, of course, to the government seeking assistance from UNDP um, for us to undertake a forestry development and watershed management project in the upland regions of Jamaica. I was very lucky to be a counterpart to the expert in forest management. This required measurement of trees, counting them, uh, assessing the volume, mapping the resources in the forest reserves of the country. Um, I was very instrumental in setting up the, forest in, the first forest inventory that we have undertaken here. I work with the Ministry of Health, so it was not difficult to imagine that I would have been interacting with them at one, in one way or the other. Pao and um, CFNI specifically, um, I remember Dr. Patterson, who was then director of CFNI, invited me to a workshop on, um, an, on consumer awareness workshop. There was a concern that um, people to need to be more concerned, need to be more aware of food safety measures. So we had this region-wide workshop at CFNI, um, hosted by CFNI, out of which we developed a region-wide communication program to promote food safety. And I think CFNI became better known throughout the Caribbean as a consequence of that workshop. I mean, if people didn't remember what CFNI was all about, all we had to do was recite or sing the first few lines from that jingle which we created out of that workshop to accompany all the messages, keep it safe, keep it clean, keep it covered. Everybody knew then what we were talking about when we said CFNI. The United Nations is possibly the most highly respected entity in the world. It spans the globe as well as every sector from communications to peacekeeping, from food to the environment. 
These Jamaicans were proud and eager to begin working at the UN. This is a great opportunity, so let me, uh, let me join, uh, join the UN. So I called them and I took it. I got my offer to go to Jerusalem, and just two weeks before I left, they changed the offer and said, no, you're not going to Jerusalem anymore. You're going to go to, um, to work in Lebanon with the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL. And I said, my goodness, what is this now? I'm going to Lebanon, it was the height of the civil war in, in, in those days. And then I thought about it and I said, why not? I was a young man and I, you know, I wanted you know, to travel. UNIFIL, the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, was created in 1978 to confirm the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Lebanon, restore international peace and security, and assist the Lebanese government in asserting its legitimate authority in the area. In an uh, environment like that where you have war, of course, there's basically no infrastructure. There's no telecom infrastructure. And um, command and control, the backbone of every command and control is telecommunication. And, and so the UN has its, its own telecommunications network, uh, own maintained for internal communications so the, the, the troops and also the civilian personnel or whoever can actually um, communicate with each other. I think it must have been in 1965 I applied to the United Nations. Um, at the time, Sir Edgerton Richardson was our ambassador. He was the first um, Jamaican ambassador to the UN from independence. And um, I made an application and waited forever. But then I was called in and I I worked with Sir Edgerton on um, International Human Rights Day, or year. Um, it was, a, it was a, an initiative by the Jamaican government, and so I attended the various meetings and wrote reports. Barely a year after becoming a member of the United Nations, Jamaica took up a leadership role at the 1963 General Assembly. Jamaica proposed that 1968 be designated the International Year for Human Rights to mark the 20th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The proposal recommended that the year be marked by an event which would highlight and bring new attention to the promise made in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It also advocated that the year should be a target towards which the UN and its member states would work with renewed public commitment to give effect to the principles of that Universal Declaration. Bringing to the UN the remarkable dedication and intensity that they devoted to all aspects of their work, drawing from their varied experience, the UN challenged them to view issues with new perspectives and a sharper understanding of equity and human rights. I worked in the Jamaica office, the Caribbean Food and Nutrition office, for at least 13 years. Another exercise which we did very well and which really branded um, PAHO in particular was work, uh, in, as it turned out, um, collaboratively with other UN agencies in developing what um, is well known as a journalism awards program. Um, our aim then was to create incentives for journalists to write more uh, responsible, um, accurate, um, interesting stories, health-related and nutrition-related, as it turns out, because I started working on this from the CFNI days. And um, this went over very well um, and continued. It was the longest-running incentive award program for journalists in the Caribbean. The UN, for me, was always something distant, you know, um, wouldn't it be nice to work for the UN? But in reality, you never think that you'll ever get there. So when the opportunity came for me, for example, to do research um, for the UN, which is perhaps how I started, um, work on free trade zones, which was what my PhD thesis was, um, interest in workers' rights, that's where I actually started. I then worked with, did consultancies for other UN agencies, including UN Women, or UNIFEM as it was at the time. Well, I joined the UNFPA in 2003 it was, and I worked there full-time for three years, first as a Population and Development Studies Advisor, and then I was Assistant Representative 
for the English and Dutch speaking Caribbean. That was a very interesting experience. Um, I learned a lot. I shared. I was able to integrate um, my previous work. I realized that I needed to look around and to move on to make use of the knowledge that I had acquired and the skills that I had developed and um, sought an opportunity to work in Rome um, where I was for not quite a year and uh, later on with the, in the Caribbean working for FAO in the Tropical Forest Reaction Plan. I was assigned to Egypt and you can well imagine, I mean it was my first overseas assignment to a country which was not an English speaking country. I didn't have one idea of, uh, about Arabic or anything of the sort. And we had four years in Cairo, and that was between the, the, um, the 69 and 73 wars, or the 67 and 73 wars. Um, the, the issues that one coped with was everything was tinged on the political crisis that obtained in the Middle East. Um, there wasn't any facet of work that you didn't, you weren't conscious of the role that the UN could play or did play. My next assignment was um, in Thailand working with refugees and I was seconded to a, a UN, another UN agency um, to provide telecommunication systems for the NGOs that were working there uh, as well as um, part of um, UNHCR. Um, this was on the Thai-Cambodian border and uh, of course um, you have refugee camps there in those days bigger than cities in Bangkok. From war zones to refugee camps and back to the front lines, or from headquarters to the burning issues of the Middle East and Africa, the UN threw up challenges to which these Jamaicans had to respond, using skills they had to develop in the midst of crises. And then soon after, um, I left to, to Namibia. It was the biggest peacekeeping mission at the time. I was um, one of the first in and last out, and that was where we really established uh, telecommunication systems. We had um, the latest of the latest. I mean, we had to provide um, telecommunication for the whole country. It's an extremely large country. The UN intervention in Namibia, a sparsely populated country spread over more than 800,000 square kilometers, was one of the largest peacekeeping missions of UN forces. In 2003, I went to Africa. I left headquarters and went to Africa to serve in Burkina Faso. And I think there again, my gender perspective influenced my prioritizing girls' education as a major program. The, this was a priority of the UN system at the time, but it was not, it, and work had been done on this in Burkina Faso, but it was not on the front page of UNICEF's work in the way, say, health was. What we did was to use a communication strategy to get buy-in from the populations because the money that UNICEF had to contribute to the programs was small compared to the money available to big donors like the World Bank and the Dutch and the Canadians who were big actors in education. So I felt that communication, which was one of my skills areas, was the best way to contribute because we needed to get the populations on board. We needed to convince people that this was important. And I would say it worked because all, all the graphs show quite a sharp increase in the educational participation in Burkina Faso from the end of 2002 to 2007 when I left, and I'm sure that others continued with it after. Issues of gender and child labor have received long-needed escalated attention since the latter half of the 20th century and there has been an urgent call to address them as a top priority. They affect much more than half of any country's present and future populations. A number of years ago, the ILO embarked on a whole process of rapid assessments um, around child labor and the worst forms of child labor, which include prostitution, pornography, and so on. So they asked me to do this study for Jamaica, uh, which was very challenging, but the ILO now sees an end to child labor. So having been a small part of that enormous process, you give thanks, you know, that um, you just have to continue working. And it makes you committed to ensure that younger people get into the UN, see the opportunities for their research being transformed into policies, programs, and so on. Jamaicans carry something special with them wherever they go, and they think it a privilege to be able to share it with the world. 
Sometimes they are surprised by the impact their nationality has on others, and it is always a joy to discover it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when I was told that I was going to do this um, Liberian peacekeeping effort, and I thought about why, why me, it, it wasn't why me, Trevor. But I think the, the Secretary General wanted, he wanted to have somebody who the country itself, um, because the U the Jamaica has been very effective in the UN, um, in the UNDP for a small country. We have um, been in the Security Council. We have chaired ECOSOC on different occasions. And various personalities, Jamaicans, have developed a reputation. I'll tell you a funny story. I was in Tanzania. We were out in the agricultural area, and I was traveling with my administrator at the time, ahead of UNDP, and they took us into this small-scale irrigation project, and our host was speaking in Swahili to the farmers who were gathered, introducing us. So when they introduced me and said Jamaica, there was a loud roar, Bob Marley. <laughs> the United Nations is the forum for defining the new frontiers of progress as reflected in the Millennium Development Goals. The UN has enabled all countries to be heard as equals, with human rights, inclusiveness, and self-determination as its guiding principles, the UN has sought a world of peace, opportunity, and sustainability, where every individual can attain their fullest potential. In this endeavor, Jamaica is a proud and valued partner. <laughs>